first case to come before us this morning is State of Ohio versus Gavin Ramsey. Both sides will have 15 minutes to present their arguments. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you'd like to reserve some time um, for rebuttal, you let me know when you get started. I'm keeping track of, track of the clocks here so I can keep you apprised of the passage of time. Please don't use the names of any victims or individuals who are currently minors. Uh, also, um, if you would mute your microphone when you are not speaking so that we don't have too much background noise should something unexpected occur. The judges have read your briefs. We are ready to proceed when you are. Good morning, Your Honors. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Charlene Boland and I, along with co-counsel Stephen Hardwick, represent Gavin Ramsey in this case. This is a remand from the Supreme Court of Ohio. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, if I may. There are three points I plan to address today. The first is State versus Patrick's application to this case. The second is the framework for how this court should review the sentence and also discuss the impact of the Jones versus Mississippi case that was decided by the US Supreme Court last Thursday and the why the sentencing court's determination in this case was wrong. So first turning to State versus Patrick, in the Patrick decision, the Ohio Supreme Court held that 295308 does not preclude an appeal of a sentence for aggravated murder that's based on constitutional grounds. This was the issue that was accepted by the Supreme Court in Gavin's case, and it ruled in his favor and then remanded it back to this court for application. There were two parts to the Patrick decision. The first was about the appealability of an aggravated murder sentence. And the second was about individualized sentencing determinations for young people who have life with parole sentences. In the direct appeal in this case, um, the merit brief on pages 12 through 14 and 26 through 27 relies on and refers to the Eighth Amendment, uh, Graham, Miller, Roper, Montgomery, and Ohio's corollary state versus long. These are all the same cases that were referenced in the second part of that state versus Patrick decision. These cases are all about individualized sentencing under an Eighth Amendment framework, and they all recognize that children are different and that sen the sentencing process must also be different. And even though this court found that it could not review the sentence back in March of 2020, this court recognized that the direct appeal arguments that Gavin was making was based on that legacy and progression of the cases from the US and Ohio Supreme Courts. So Gavin is making an Eighth Amendment claim here on eighth, uh, individualized sentencing grounds um, based on those cases from the US and Ohio Supreme Court. So Patrick does apply to this case and this court can review his sentence. The counsel, next counsel, 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 can I just interrupt you? Okay, can I just, am I making that noise? Hmm, maybe not. Okay, could I interrupt you and just ask you, it's, it seems to me like, and I don't wanna put words in the state's mouth, but it seems to me like they're saying that with the new amendments to sentencing statutes, that this is almost like moot and that it's, it should go back and he'll be eligible for parole. Isn't that all you're really seeking anyway? Your Honor, we are asking for a new resentencing hearing. Um, I will briefly address the new sentencing under Senate Bill 256. I would just note that this, this direct appeal is not about Senate Bill 256. Um, Senate Bill 256 does make changes for the future. Um, the way that I read the new statute, which is 2967.132, it directs the adult parole authority to review cases after a certain period of time as delineated in that statute. So the appeal in this case, this, uh, this is sort of a continuation of the direct appeal after the remand. And this is what was noted in State versus Patrick is that it's the judiciary's prerogative to be charged with the safeguarding of the constitution. And so there might be, uh, based on 256, there's parole eligibility in the future, but this direct appeal is really looking at the sentencing process that happened um, when Gavin was sentenced and was given a life without parole sentence. And that's what the court noted in Patrick. It's at paragraph 36, is that notwithstanding any eligibility for parole in the future, 
um, the sentencing process that is handed down uh, from the U.S. Supreme Court and the Ohio Supreme Courts have to meet those Eighth Amendment guidelines. And for youth, that's individualized sentencing. So the framework that we are asking this court um, to review this case today, um, first I want to address the Jones versus Mississippi case that was decided last Thursday. So the question that was before the U.S. Supreme Court in that case was whether irreparable corruption, that binding, was required on the record before a life without parole sentence could be given to a young person. The U.S. Supreme Court said no, based on the language of Montgomery versus Louisiana. But what's really important about that case and how it applies uh, to our discussion today is that the court reaffirmed the importance of individualized sentencing and held that Miller versus Alabama remains good law. And in the decision, Justice Kavanaugh wrote that nothing in the Jones decision impedes a state's ability to go further, to require more protections for young people, or to even outright abolish life without parole for children going forward. And so Jones does not require a uh, irreparable corruption finding, but it does uh, highlight the importance again and reaffirms that individualized sentencing, all of the youthfulness factors and its attendant circumstances must be um, in the case in order for it to meet the Eighth Amendment um, to be constitutional under the Eighth Amendment. But didn't the trial court here do all that anyway? I mean, she looked at the nature of the crime. Obviously, she looked at the fact that this uh, young man was 17 years old at the time and made a determination based on the facts of the case as well as the individual's age and prior history and so forth in making her sentencing decision. So how is this any different? Your Honor, it is true that the uh, sentencing court did note Gavin's age. He was 17 at the time of the offense on the record. But this consideration is that we are asking this court in the review is to look at the considerations that the trial court made, the rationale that was given for the sentence, and does that mesh with the mitigating information that was presented to the court? And so, as I noted, irreparable corruption is not a required finding. But in this case, the court said, um, and this is on page 211 of the sentencing transcript, the summation paragraph before the, the trial court handed down the sentence is that Gavin is irreparably corrupt. And so it's not a required finding, but that was part of the court's rationale here. And the court stated that he will, he is, uh, he will, sorry, your honors, my light went off, um, that he will unable, he is, he will never be able, excuse me, to, to be fit to reenter society. And so if the court rationale is that this young person does not have the capacity to change, that's a very important individualized sentencing consideration that has to mesh with the evidence that was presented. And what we know is the trial court actually gave a lot of information for us to be able, for this court to be able to review on pages 205 through 211 of the sentencing transcript, the judge noted the reasons, uh, the rationale for handing down the life without parole sentence. And we know that the judge relied heavily on the sentencing evaluation from the court clinician, Dr. Jones. And so we have all of the information from that sentencing evaluation, but what's important to note is that the conclusion is not acknowledged. The conclusion is not part of that recitation of facts. And that conclusion was that Gavin has a guarded treatment prognosis and Dr. Jones further explained uh, in testimony that he does not meet the worst criteria, that it is possible for him to benefit from treatment. The uh, court clinician went on to say that some of the treatment recommendations that she would make would be individualized counseling, sex offender treatment, um, and substance abuse treatment, and then noted that some of those recommendations she knows aligns with the treatment offerings at the state prison system. And so if the court's rationale here is that I don't believe that this, that this young person is irreparably corrupt, will never be able to have the capacity to change, that does not fit with the mitigating evidence. It's an unreasonable explanation given the conclusion from the court clinician who had all the information. And so that's what the review about is about in this case. Yes, the trial court uh, placed the general understandings about youthfulness on the record. The court noted that the brain was not uh, finished, de finished developing until the mid twenties. The court noted his age, 
But the individualized sentencing also has to include those individual characteristics about the young person that's sitting across from the judge. Well, and counsel, let me let me ask you a quick question since we're in felony sentencing land here. Um, what's our standard of review? Is it with respect to the trial court's findings? I think that is a very interesting question, Your Honor. Um, and so I know normally we're under uh, clear and convincingly contrary to law. Under State versus Patrick, the court said that this was not a sentencing a review under 2953.08 where that contrary to law language lives. Um, and so uh, the way that I have framed this and the way that the narrative brief frames this is an abuse of discretion. Um, which is an unreasonable or arbitrary application. Um, and so I think that that makes sense considering we are outside of 2953.08. This is a discretionary system. And in State versus Long, the Ohio Supreme Court noted um, that, um, that states, or courts in Ohio, sentencing courts in Ohio had discretion to state its reasons on the record. And so they don't have to go through every single, single Miller factor, but they have discretion to state their reasons. And so I think that because we're in a discretionary system, Ohio gives courts discretion to fully explain what factors they are relying on as long as usefulness is considered. I think abuse of discretion is an appropriate standard here. But um, as I was looking through the case law, I know that this court had previously um, in the, the Rafferty case, in reviewing the sentence in that case, it was a contrary to law um, analysis. I'm not sure that that is still the appropriate standard based on the Patrick decision and that 2953.08 is not the statute that we are appealing under. And so I would, I would ask this court to review this under an abuse of discretion standard, which is, which is a high bar. But I think, I think what's important is looking at, we know that the court relied on this evaluation. Um, the court went through the evaluation, but it is unreasonable to rely on that evaluation, but then not acknowledge the conclusion, which is that Gavin is not irreparably corrupt. He does have the possibility to benefit from treatment. And that's a really important key factor when you're looking at youthfulness is a young person's capacity for change um, and knowing that the brain is not fully developed. Two other pieces of information that I think are important to note for this court um, that do not appear in pages 205 to 211 of the sentencing transcripts, which is that summation, um, are the, the judge does note that Gavin started exhibiting uh, problematic behaviors when he was 10, but there's no mention that those behaviors were precipitated by his sexual abuse. He was, when he was eight years old, he was sexually abused. And so there's no mention of that there, which is again, another factor under the Miller considerations. There is Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate that. Um, just one other, one other mitigating point that I want to note that goes towards the, those Miller considerations is there a men, there's a mention of his intermittent counseling, but it's also important to note that as a 13, 14, 15 year old child, Gavin himself would not be in charge of his medical decisions. And so those are important things to note that were presented in mitigation that also did not appear in the court's explanation or rationale. And so um, I would like to save the rest of my time for rebuttal, but we would ask this court to reverse for a new sentencing hearing. Thank you, your honors. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good morning, your honors. And may it please the court, I'm Vince Vellucci with the Medina County Prosecutor's Office for the appellee of the state of Ohio. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's a narrow, uh, narrower issue that we're uh, considering uh, th this time around on uh, Mr. Ramsey in terms of the, the impact of the Patrick case and the remand uh, in, this, in this matter uh, that, that, that the Supreme Court has done. Uh, the, the Patrick case uh, did hold that uh, 2953.08.D3 uh, does not prevent appellate courts from, from reviewing an aggravated murder sent, sentence when the defendant raises a constitutional claim regarding that sentence. Uh, however, uh, unlike Patrick, uh, Ramsey in this case did not raise a constitutional claim in his direct appeal to this court. He did not invoke the Eighth Amendment, did not invoke 
Article One, Section Nine of the Ohio Constitution, as as he did before the Ohio Supreme Court when he had his his new counsel from the Ohio well, uh, Council. When um, let's just stop you briefly. When when it went to the Supreme Court, did the state of Ohio make this very same argument that he was precluded from reaching those issues because he had not to the Supreme Court? I mean, yes, Your Honor, we did. Uh, in fact, uh, in our in our memorandum in opposition to jurisdiction, we we said that was that was our that was one of our arguments for them not not even taking this case, but but they did take the case, and then they ultimately just issued that one line decision, and they did not decide that issue. They just said on the basis of Patrick, we're we're remanding this. There was no oral argument, obviously, and nothing, nothing like that. So uh, there was no further fleshing out of that, but. Um, I think that's a that's a threshold issue here in terms of the of procedurally, uh, but I think on the merits as well we're on very firm ground in in saying under Miller under Montgomery under last week's Jones v Mississippi decision which which reaffirmed this in no uncertain terms that that life without parole for crimes committed by juveniles is constitutional there is no Eighth Amendment issue with it. Um, Long also, the Ohio Supreme Court has said that as well. They did say that, of course, youth has to be considered in, in Long, and that's and that happened in this case. And 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 my opposing counsel, my friend here, has uh, acknowledged that. Um, now, what what uh, Jones v. Mississippi added, though, was that a, a, a separate finding of permanent incorrigibility is not required in order to sentence. A, a juvenile to to life without parole. So they basically just upheld what the law has always been. They just I, I think they said it uh, a bit more strongly than they have in the past that this is constitutional. Um, in, in terms of the uh, 295308 D3 being constitutional, that that actual uh, question was was uh, posed directly in the State v. Kinney case, which was decided on the same day as Patrick. And ultimately, uh, the court sort of tacitly uh, upheld the constitutionality of that statute. They, they didn't directly address it. Um, they basically said, since we're finding in Patrick that, you don't, that, that this isn't the only way to appeal, to, to challenge a uh, aggravated murder or murder statute, you can challenge it on constitutional grounds. And we don't even need to basically get to the idea of whether it's constitutional or not. So I think, I think it is constitutional, that statute. Uh, it's, it's not a cruel and unusual punishment issue again. And, and I think there was a very strongly worded dissent that said that, you know, this shouldn't even be considered under cruel and unusual punishment in terms of this statute of what you can and can't appeal. Um, but again, um, th there is this new uh, statute uh, that, that was passed. In, in, in the meantime, while, while this case was going on, uh, one that we obviously uh, strongly disagree with, and then our Ohio Prosecuting Attorneys Association strongly disagrees with, and that, that uh, we're going to be fighting to get changed or modified, uh, because uh, this, this new law uh, under Senate Bill 256 uh, actually became effective on April 12th, uh, just, just this month, uh, and, and, that, and that new law basically says that a juvenile cannot receive life without parole for murdering one person, cannot receive life without parole for murdering two people, uh, but has to murder three people to be eligible for that sentence. Um, the, the law almost completely eliminates judicial discretion in, in these most serious cases. And, and that discretion would certainly be useful in a case like this. When you have a juvenile who's committed uh, what has been widely regarded as the most heinous crime in Medina County history, and and, and when I went through all the details of that in my in my first brief and my first oral argument, I, I and and in terms of Dr. Lynn Luna Jones's report about the most damning report you can imagine uh, about a defendant in terms of being irreparably corrupt and unable to be rehabilitated. Um, 
but but nonetheless, excuse me, counsel, but nonetheless, the conclusion was that it was guarded. Which is uh, sort of the, the, the second to the worst uh, thing you could be. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't say that's a that's a good thing. No, that's I a, understand, but doesn't that leave the possibility of rehabilitation? Because you just said it wasn't the worst. Well, I, I think when you look at the entire report in its totality and, and what her conclusions were in terms of uh, his uh, sexual sadism disorder and, and things like that, uh, you know, things that uh, would make it very difficult uh, for somebody in, in terms of, of, of his uh, just fascination with, with serial killers and, and, and the things he was writing and uh, he, he, admitting to police that, you know, I, I would have done this again if you hadn't caught me. You, you know, um, th th this was a serial killer in the making. <clears throat> and thank goodness, uh, the, the Wadsworth Police Department was able to apprehend this individual uh, be, before that was able to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, we think that 25 years to life is, is still inadequate, but, but we obviously want to make sure that uh, when Mr. Ramsey is resentenced, he does at least receive that maximum under the new law that, that is required. And uh, I, I know that, that this court could, uh, could resentence him uh, theoretically itself uh, or, or modify his sentence or could remand to the, to the trial court for resentencing. Um, so uh, I, I think I would just, uh, from the state's perspective, our preference would be to, to remand it to the trial court because the victim's family who was very upset about this new law uh, and, and I think rightfully so uh, would like to be heard at a, at a resentencing hearing. Sure that Mr. Ramsey at the very least uh, does receive the maximum allowable under this new law, the, the 25 years to life in prison um, and again, the, the, the trial court went into a lot of detail considering Mr. Ramsey's age on the record, uh, I think they did everything. I, I think she did. Uh, the trial judge did everything uh, that that she was required to do and more, and, and went above and beyond to consider uh, his youth. And conducted this this sentencing hearing uh, almost like a mitigation phase of a of a death penalty trial. This, this was a full blown hearing that was held, almost like a trial. There were seven witnesses that uh, that presented evidence. And, and were actually uh, allowed to be cross-examined. The judge actually, uh, the trial judge allowed in uh, Ramsey's expert report from Dr. Peter Bregan, which was uh, attempting to, uh, to refute some of the things that Dr. Lynn Luna Jones was saying. And she allowed that in over the state's objection when, uh, when Dr. Bregan did not even appear uh, at, the, uh, at this hearing to testify. So the state was not, not able to cross-examine him, but she still allowed his report in and considered it. Um, so he, he got a, a, a good deal of uh, due process in terms of going above and beyond to consider everything possible that, that they could about this, uh, this juvenile. And uh, in terms counsel, of the standard, counsel, counsel. Uh, the state saying the uh, defense's argument in regard to, um, um, I mean, with their expert, their argument was that he wasn't violent before the Zoloft. Did uh, the state, I mean, to the um, Dr. Jones, did she um, remark in any shape, manner, or form in regard to that about uh, this 
violence tendencies or the sadomasochism, or whatever, before um, he was on Zoloft? Yes, I and and I think well, her her report was done before Dr. Bregan's uh, report, but uh, in terms of of that, he, he was writing all of these things and ha having all of these violent fantasies and and, and sexual. Uh, sexually deviant fantasies and serial killer writings, all, all of that happened before he started Zoloft. Uh, not to mention all of the other crimes that he committed in the run-up to this crime. Obviously nothing as uh, nearly as serious as this, but uh, he was uh, meeting older men for sex and then uh, carjacking them essentially. Uh, he, he was breaking and entering. Uh, he was breaking into uh, trailers and, and uh, various things. He, he had a criminal record uh, and, and he was sort of, he was on a criminal path before this happened. And, and it's interesting what Dr. Bregan said, even admitted in, in his report, was, was the, that Ramsey said to him, he doesn't know what effect the, the Zoloft had on him because he was so hopped up on marijuana and alcohol. He was drinking a fifth of alcohol, hard liquor, every day, he, he admitted. He was smoking three marijuana cigarettes a day. And, and to say that, uh, that Zoloft uh, was, <laughs> was the factor here that uh, really put it over the top is just absurd. And, and the trial court uh, rightfully found it to be so. And I think that, that, that even hurt him quite a bit at his sentencing because uh, he wasn't really taking responsibility and, and he was blaming his actions on a, on a drug, uh, on a uh, drug that's meant to help him and, and has helped millions and millions of people. Uh, so with this sort of fringe science from somebody who just doesn't like antidepressants, essentially. Uh, so, um, you, you know, she chose to go that route at at the at the sentencing hearing instead of taking full responsibility for his actions, and uh, and I think that's a that's at least a part of why he was sentenced to life without parole, and, and rightfully so. In terms of the standard of review. Um, you know, I, 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 I would refer to the Markham decision, which, which does talk about, uh, I, I don't believe that's been overruled, that, uh, that, that a court may, may vacate or modify a felony sentence only if it's determined by clear and convincing evidence that, uh, one, the, the record does not support the trial court's findings under relevant statutes, or two, that the sentence is otherwise contrary to law. And, and basically that, that case is just applying 2953-08-G2, which lays out that same standard. Uh, and I, I don't believe that statute has been, has been overruled either. So um, it, it's interesting that, the, that, that they would act, that, that, uh, <laughs> that my, my friend is, is asking for a higher standard, apparently the, uh, the abuse of discretion, but um, I, 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 I don't, I don't know that Patrick's intent was to, was to change the standard of review for, for felony sentences. Um, I, I think what Patrick did was just make sure to, to, to clarify that uh, it, it's broader than just the felony appeal law. There's, there's other ways to, to appeal uh, a, a felony sentence. Uh, specifically an aggravated murder or murder sentence. And, and you can do that on constitutional grounds. Um, but, but again, I go back to my first point, it, that didn't happen in this case, that there was not an appeal on constitutional grounds until the second appeal. And counsel, unfortunately with that, I need to let you know that you have utilized your 15 minutes for oral argument this morning. Thank you. Thank you, your honors. Counsel for the appellant, you have two minutes and 40 seconds. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just briefly on, on rebuttal, I'll just note that uh, the Supreme Court in Patrick did not overrule 295308 or say that it was unconstitutional. It just merely said that 295308 is not the only means by which a person can bring an appeal. 
Um, and so that is why the aggravated murder appeal, uh, appeal, you are allowed to appeal an aggravated murder sentence if you're raising a constitutional question. But it's outside of 29.5308 that we are now appealing. So that's just the important point to um, make about Patrick. And then finally, just to, to, to really um, to end the argument, two truths exist in this case. Um, there was a violent offense and a woman was killed. And Gavin was 17 years old. Both of those things are true at the same time in this case. And that's really the, the, the point of all of the US and Ohio Supreme Court cases is that young people do commit violent crimes. But in order to make sure that a sentence is not disproportionate under the Eighth Amendment, that individualized determination must be there, both about the general understandings that we have about youth and their specific individualized circumstances. Counsel, yes. I just want to, and obviously this has been discussed, you know, in case law for, for years, but, you know, individualized sentencing and so forth. <clears throat> and, you know, the, uh, this, the opinion now is that uh, young people, their brains are not fully developed till their mid twenties, but nonetheless at 18, you're an adult. Okay. And this young man was not too far from 18. Shouldn't that have been able to be considered by the court as she did? <clears throat> The, uh, the case law is clear that the bright line is at age 18. I would agree with you that the, the uh, brain science research shows us that it's actually now between 25 and 30 um, is when the brain, the, the frontal lobe is fully developed. But the bright line has been drawn at 18. And so people who are under the age of 18 share the same characteristics. Their brains are not fully developed. They have less culpability. And the Miller factors, as we laid out in the, um, the supplemental brief, apply. Certainly a court can take into consideration how 14 year olds might be different than 17 year olds. But what's important about this case is that there were individualized um, assessments that were made about Gavin. The court looked at those assessments, but then did not acknowledge the final conclusion from that expert, which, that, which is that he does have the possibility to benefit from treatment. And so that does not mesh with the rationale that the court gave in this case. And so we would ask this court to reverse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations today. The court will take the matter under advisement. We will issue a decision in due course. On the day the decision is issued, the, the clerk will send a copy in the mail to both sides, as well as it will be posted on the Ohio Supreme Court website. Thank you both.